Uh, welcome to Alien Theorist Theorizing. Uh, we got a special interview episode again this week. I'm Braden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And I'm Andrew. And this time we've got senior SETI astronomer superstar Seth Shostag, author, uh, astronomer extraordinaire, and we're super excited to have him here uh this <laughs> this case file i suppose i'm gushing like i'm i'm freaking out because i'm super excited to have you uh here dan talks Seth. about you all the time <laughs> yeah does he? dan needs yeah. help yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's been brought up he does he's actually, got a yeah. green screen behind him to cover up all your pictures behind it's, <laughs> yeah it's just all it's all uh show stack memorabilia back there yeah yeah um <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I remember uh, reading your book a couple of years ago, the Confessions of a Alien Hunter um, book, and uh, just a great, great read all around. Just kind of getting, I think it's wonderful, it's like looking into radio astronomy and these things, and it's kind of just right up our alley, uh, looking up these things, and we're just like, I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm pumped. <laughs> yeah. Now, Seth, for people who are not familiar with you, I mean, this is this is not your this has not been your lifelong job like you've had many jobs in the past so how did you get into SETI and uh, searching for signs of other intelligent extraterrestrial life well you're right uh, about my checkered past I've had many different jobs in many different fields actually um, that's because I can't quite decide on what it is that uh, I find interesting but as far as SETI goes yeah you know I yeah I was interested in aliens I mean even as a grad student, I was using antennas that could be used to pick up <laughs> alien broadcasts. So that, you know, that was already, uh, that already led to an interest. But as far as uh, more, yeah, as far as more recent events go, I, I guess I got in, interested in this when I moved to California. That was in 1988 after living in Europe for a while. That's a good year. And, uh, hmm? That's a good year, 1988. Was it? Are you referring to you know Vino or just being a good year because you were born that year? Or? Yeah, we were born that year. Or two <laughs> of us him. were. <laughs> Got him. Well, eighty-eight. Yeah, yeah, it was an okay year. Anyhow, I moved here. The SETI Institute found uh, found out that I was living in the area. SETI Institute. Well, it wasn't even the SETI Institute. Well, I guess it was at that point. But they were only about two miles away from where I'm living, and uh, they asked me if I wanted a job. So that's oh, how that happened. They, they didn't name it after you? I thought it was Sethi. Isn't that what it is? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, al it? it's almost my name. Not quite. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. If you find something, they will change it to Sethi. <laughs> yes, they may even give me a raise if we find something. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that I, I always you always hear is that like we're looking at space, and I, I've heard you talk about it in another show, so I thought maybe you could uh, update our listeners, is that when we're looking at the sky, it's like scooping up the ocean with a, ta a tablespoon is what we always say. And we, we've come a long way from that adage, right? Like we're, we're doing more now and probably – very quickly with AI going to be doing a lot more uh, than just a tablespoon now, right? Like we're, we're doing a little better than that, that old analogy. Well, we are, but it, you know, improvement is measured typically by factors of two. So it takes a lot of factors of two to go from a tablespoon to something like a bucket. And even then you're not getting much of the ocean. So yeah. there's, there's a long road to hoe when it comes yeah. to greatly increasing the speed of the search. So in your words, what are we at? A quarter cup? <laughs> I, I actually haven't done the calculation recently. It's, it's probably a kitty bucket, something like that. That's good. All right. Good. So we can make a sand castle thought. out of that. We'll be all right. <laughs> um, so I, what I'm kind of curious is like, you know, uh, with your long career, um, you know, and the, your years of exploring space through radio astronomy and, and the like, um, has, what's your, what's your, what's your kind of view on the prospect of finding alien life? Like, has it changed like throughout your career? Has it waxed and waned? Like, how is it, how is it developed and like, where is it at right now? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you this. I mean, you know, there's alien life, and that could be microbes on Mars. And then there's alien intelligent life, which is not right. microbes on Mars. Right. And if we're talking about microbes, you know, there are plenty of uh, efforts underway to explore places like Mars, but even some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, where you have liquids, in particular, mostly liquid water, uh, where there might be some sort of bacteria there, and that's life. 
And if you find it, you could say, well, I'm not all that excited by, by bacteria. But uh, on the other hand, if you were to find them, you would say, okay, at least life is not a miracle. Life is something that we can find elsewhere. And that would be, you know, really interesting. I mean, that I, I don't know that the public would get so excited about it, but the scientists certainly would because it would show you that, you know, okay, just making something that that's alive is not so hard for nature to do. That is that. Oh, but well, as far as the looking for our aliens, listeners of our show would think that's incredible news too. So would us because you yeah. know that, that instantly means for us it's like if it's if it's in our solar system on another planet, you know, extrapolate that it's everywhere. And if it's everywhere, that means the chances of us finding that intelligent life for go yeah, up that's true. That's true. But it, but it might not be found in our solar system. Of course. I mean, if you were yeah. to find, you know, oxygen in the atmosphere, some extra solar planet. That would tell you that uh, there's some photosynthesis going on, you know, on one of the worlds of that system, and that that would be interesting too. So finding life uh, would be interesting, but I think that nothing could compare to finding, for example, a signal that tells you that it's not just life, but it's intelligent life because they're sending us, you know, their personal philosophies. So, yeah, so that, that was sorry. That was a question I was going to ask actually. Like when you're when SETI's scanning the skies with all these radio telescopes, uh, I mean. What was the uh, Arecibo that mysteriously kind of collapsed? That was probably a big blow to the community. But what, uh, what, what exactly? What is? What are the signals you're actually looking for? Are we looking for like alien TV, radio, or is there a, a specific pattern? Or well, you, you don't even care. By the way, uh, it, it didn't mysteriously collapse. It collapsed, but it wasn't terribly mysterious. I mean, it, it was some mystery because you know the uh, early on there was a little bit of mystery. Well, the, the hardware that was used there should not have, you know, given way. But right. on the other hand, there's, a, there's quite a bit of a history of radio telescopes collapsing. The 300-foot telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia collapsed, you know, a number of years before Arecibo. And that's not supposed to have collapsed either. So these things are apparently more fragile than we think. That Anyhow, <laughs> but your question was different. The question was, all right, I mean, what was your question? What would be the effect <laughs> No, like what when you're when you're using these devices to look for alien signals, what type of signal are you looking for? Just like well, uh, in layman's terms. Yeah, yeah, very simple. We we look for what are called narrow band signals. In other words, the signal is at a particular spot on the radio dial. I mean, we don't know which which spot, but it's not all over the dial, and that's the big difference. You know, if you're tuning uh, in a signal at fourteen fifty five megahertz or wherever it is, if you go to fourteen sixty five megahertz, you won't hear it. Right, or 1445. So it's at one spot on the dial. And that's the kind of signal that nature doesn't make. Nature makes lots of radio waves, but they're all over the dial, right? I mean, you can tune almost anywhere and hear a quasar or a pulsar. Right? It, does, it doesn't depend very strongly on the frequency that you're tuned to. But if you're tuning in your favorite TV show or radio show or something like that, it's at a particular frequency, you know, a small range of frequencies uh, uh, around, you know, 105.8 megahertz on your dial or whatever it is right and that's the difference between a transmitter and nature right like like the sun for say probably gives off it's a whole spectrum of radio frequency it does it does it's the strongest radio source in the sky oh. <laughs> um so i along those lines i, I kind of want to ask the question like in in your opinion like what are probably i would say maybe the top or top three or i gonna give you an that kind of whatever uh like innovations in in the field of radio astronomy or astronomy in general that you think have the best or uh, like have the best chance of like finding uh, or detecting intelligent life like what do you think is going to help us the most in the coming years or decades well probably the biggest you know uh spur to doing this kind of work was, was nothing technical at all well it was based on technology and that was discovering that planets are very plentiful Right. Right. You know, prior to 1995, we didn't know if there were other planets out there or not. I mean, we knew about the ones in our solar system and we kind of assumed that there were other solar systems, but we didn't really know that. It was just a guess. And we also didn't know, you know, what what the prevalence of solar systems might be. Now, today we know that, you know, 80 percent of all stars have planets at least. And maybe the real percentage is a lot closer to 100 percent. But 80 percent is already close to 100 percent. So that suggests that, you know, there's just a, an awful lot of real estate where you might hope to find life. And some of that 
life might be intelligent life. And that, as I say, that's news. That's something of the past couple of dozen years. For me, that's relatively new. Maybe not for you guys, but that that uh, that is, you know, the 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 big astronomy development. Now, as far as technology goes, well, that's just sort of a steady improvement ever since the first experiment to actually look for signals that were made by aliens. And that was Frank Drake's experiment in 1960. That's a long time ago, right? That's more than six decades. And uh, of course, since then, the receivers that we have have gotten better. To some extent, the sensitivity has gotten better. But one of the big differences is now we can look over a very wide range of frequencies all at once, something that really wasn't possible in 1960. So the experiment has gotten better simply because of technology. Just the slow progression of human innovation. Well, slow if you're a Klingon, yes. <laughs> um, I probably, but yeah, that's probably my next, yeah, speaking of Klingons, that was one of the questions I written down. So um, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> not specifically Klingons, but uh, I was, I was thinking, so, you know, if you are referring to Klingons, I, Star Trek fan, yes. Well, I was a Star Trek fan, yes. I, I mean, for the original series, because I, right. I was only middle-aged when the original series uh, came on the, the tube. And in fact, uh, I was living in L.A. at the time. I was in grad school. And we got to occasionally interview some of the writers for uh, Star Trek because, you know, they were, they were just across town, that kind of thing. So it was kind of an interesting show. I, I still think it's an interesting show. And in uh -huh. fact, yeah, and, and one of my... My relatives was dating Leonard Nimoy's cousin, stuff like that. I mean, it had a personal, <laughs> as, personal aspect to it. Yeah, that's right. It turned out that Nimoy's ears were genuine. It was Fox, <laughs> uh, not Fox. It was uh, Captain Kirk's ears that were fake. That's oh, what we were told. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. <laughs> that adds up. Um, one question I had, we've kind of talked about it on this, on the show before. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, like, we've kind of talked about this theory about you know, we're receiving signals and maybe we're not receiving signals um, because other civilizations know that there's maybe like a, a apex predator civilization out there. The, the dark forest hypothesis. Um, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that um, there's any danger to us sending signals, receiving signals from other planets that this could potentially be an issue? Well, I mean, there is this question that you point out, the dark forest idea that uh, nobody's going to broadcast because, doggone it, you don't know what's out there. And it might be aggressive. It might be dangerous. It's, you know, you don't want to shout in the jungle, which is the dark forest uh, metaphor there. But on the other hand, you know, space is big, really big. As they say on the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, it's really big. And that means that you know, it's hard to imagine that there is a heck of a lot of danger, even if you're, you know, shouting out into the cosmos all the time and anybody with the right equipment can pick up your signal and know that on this small planet, right, around this nondescript star we call the sun, that there's something that thinks of itself as intelligent. And, uh, but, but I don't know that they would spend the money to come here and do what? I mean, you know, in the movies, they tend to flatten Los Angeles I'm in Northern California, and I have no problem with a flattening Los Angeles as a, as a project. That sounds okay. It, it will provide a lot of room for new condos and stuff. But, I mean, it doesn't strike me as something that any thinking society would do, which is to say, to go light years away and destroy some other civilization, which is obviously no threat to them. It doesn't seem to me like that's a really a cost-effective thing to do. No, it makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Now, my second question with that is, if say tomorrow, you you pop in your office and there there it is, this you're getting signals uh, from an alien race. Is, what's the protocol for you to report this stuff? Is the public going to find out right away, or is this going to get red taped, uh, slap some classified, and uh, you get promoted to some top secret agency? We don't hear from you again. Yeah, exactly. That's what I hope will happen. Uh, it'll all be kept under wraps for the next uh, 500 years. No, come on. This, <laughs> there is a protocol, actually. In fact, I was involved with the rewriting of that protocol. But you can forget the protocol. We know what's really going to happen. And it isn't the protocol. If we pick up a signal, the first thing you want to do, of course, you would check it again, you know, see if yeah. you can pick it up every time you look. But the next thing you do is you'd call up somebody at another radio observatory, somebody else with a radio telescope and say, hey, look, 
uh, point your instrument in this direction and over this range of frequencies, see if you can find a signal. Because, you know, you, you, you may just be under the illusion that you found a signal and all you've done is found something wrong in your software. So you would want confirmation by people who are not involved with your project. And that means that immediately now several groups around the world know about this signal. There's no way you could keep it uh, quiet. And there's no effort made to keep it quiet, actually. Nowhere in these protocols does it say, now the first thing to do is shut up and not tell anybody. That's not the way it works. The first thing you do is you tell anybody you want. And Perfect. so you couldn't keep it quiet. Now, mind you, I, I don't know what the danger in that is. I mean, just listening is not dangerous. Uh, you could argue that, well, maybe the, as soon as anybody found that we were, you know, picking up a signal from the aliens, that the, they would get on the air with their backyard satellite dish and tell them, look, uh, we, we'd like to invite you guys to planet Earth. But the deal is you've got to take out those guys over there first so that we'll be friendly to you or something like that. I mean, that it's trying to take some sort of advantage of this. But I, I don't think that's very realistic. Um, yeah, it's, along that vine, like um, in in your line of work, like I'm wondering, like what's the what's the general like I guess like the spirit of cooperation amongst like international, like internationally, like what is the what is the community like um, among like the radio astronomy? Like, yeah, if you were gonna do this, like would you call would you call scientists and you say like Italy first, or would it be like a like China first, or is there like a is there like a, a preference or something like I. I'm just generally curious. <laughs> well, I, there, there undoubtedly is a preference, but the preference is not to, on the basis of whether you like Italian food or, you know, a Chinese food or whatever. I mean, it's on the basis of do they have an instrument that could verify what you just picked up? And, other, and, and you know, one, is it big enough? In other words, is it sensitive enough to pick up the signal? Secondly, do they have the kind of receivers that can get to that particular part of the radio dial? And third, are they, in the you know, in the right range of uh, latitudes of the earth that they could actually even see wherever the signals come mm -hmm. from. So those are all just practical considerations. And those would be the ones that you would first, con you know, uh, worry about. I mean, you know, the idea that, well, maybe you won't do that because you'll, uh, you know, you'll think that there may be some security uh, aspect right. to this whole discovery. I, I don't think that the, the people that do this, the scientists that do these kinds of experiments, are really thinking along those lines very much. None yeah, that I, I know. <laughs> yeah. I hope not. Uh, and, 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 and you can't shut it up either. I mean, if some, you know, if you were to find the signal in some country where the government decides, well, we better keep this under wraps. Look, the signal's up in the sky. Anybody can find it. Yeah, yeah you can't. Uh, matter of time no one else. owns the airwaves in space. Well, that's right. Yeah. Actually, somebody not does. Yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's Howard Hughes. Yes. <laughs> Andrew, do we, do we sit on a question there? Did we cut you off earlier? Yeah, it's already got asked. Both oh, of got them. asked? Um, yeah. yeah. Stole them. <laughs> All right. I, I, I got so a question. here's a question. Well, here, I got another one. What, okay, he's so got far, one. Perfect. What's the most compelling evidence that you've come across? Well, look, this is a one-bit experiment. Until you find them, you, you haven't found them. So none of the, you know, none of the data that we've collected so far indicates you know, or causes us to believe that, well, wait a minute, that might be an alien signal. It isn't that you have a stack of signals, you know, all of which look like they could be aliens and these are the better ones and those are the less good ones or whatever. I mean, you don't have anything. Until you find them, you haven't found them. So then right. that kind of brings me to wonder what your thoughts on the Fermi paradox is. Well, yeah, the Fermi paradox, <laughs> I don't know if it con concerned Fermi very much, but uh, for those who don't know, the Fermi paradox simply says that, you know, uh, if, if the sky is actually filled with signals, or put it this way, if the universe has a lot of intelligent beings, then there, there ought to be, you know, signals all over the place. We should have no trouble, trouble finding a signal because there's so many inhabitants of the Milky Way and they want to communicate that uh, we should find some signals. And the fact that we haven't found any signals suggests that either there are no aliens out there or they're all being quiet. They're, they're all mum for some reason. And, I, you know, that's making a very big uh, conclusion from a very simple observation, namely that we haven't found a signal yet. It could be that, you know, you could have, I suppose you could have uh, invoked the Fermi paradox back in 1491, you know, talking to this guy, Chris Columbus, who wants to spend some government money to sail west. 
And you say, look, man, I mean, if there really was anything out there that was interesting to find, like a whole bunch of new continents or something, yeah. you know, <laughs> we would have found it by now. So it's just a waste of time. Right, well, that wasn't true. And I think the same can be said about finding signals. The fact that we haven't found any so far, I mean, you can make a laundry list of reasons why that might be true and just don't include the possibility that nobody's out there. Well, just just the just the distance itself, if you go just with by light speed. I mean, just just the distance, even if they were only, you know, a hundred light years away and they started progressing at the same time as humanity and they discovered radio waves we would probably, we'd be just getting their signals now. Yeah, but the chances that they, that their uh, technical development or evolution is uh, parallel to ours. Parallel. Is, is saying, yeah, I, I think that that's, <laughs> that's like, I don't know, I mean, uh, you know, walking down the street and grabbing the, the fourth person you find and learning that they have the same uh, chess ranking as you do. <laughs> I mean, it could be, but it's not very likely. Highly unlikely, or the other. It's only one way to find out. That's the other, that's pretty other scenario. In <laughs> tied, tied for dead last. So, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or per, perhaps a civilization did advance and have been gone for so long that their their signatures are long lost, and we'll never find them. Well, I, I'm sure that there have been plenty of uh, societies that have inhabited the Milky Way in the past that are gone for whatever reason, and we'll never discover them unless we land on their planet and, you know, find their garbage or something. I mean, yeah, th that, that could be. But unless you think that the frequency of, you know, evolving an intelligent species is very low, in other words, that we really don't have any cosmic company here at the present time, uh, then there should be plenty of worlds where they're, they're producing signals. And it may not even be worlds. I mean, we, we tend to think of this in terms of, you know, little green guys or gray guys or whatever who, you know, walk around, never smile, never tell you their names, you know, don't put on clothes and stuff like that. I mean, that's the way we envision the aliens. But remember, I mean, we're kind of inventing our own successors here, like chat, GBT or whatever. I mean, we're inventing the rulers of this planet 100 years from now, and that's artificial intelligence. So presumably most of the aliens that could that have radio, you know, for, okay, for 100 years, they're on the air. But after a couple of hundred years, they've invented their successor. So it, it may be that the, the aliens we're looking for are just machines. Uh, on to that idea, I remember reading, I remember reading the, reading the book that uh, our final invention, I think it was our final invention, and then they had a blurb in there about uh, with you and talking about how perhaps we're not exactly looking in the, the, the correct spot. If you're looking for, you know, as you said, AI, like we shouldn't be looking at planets. There are other areas that would probably be more suitable for an artificial super intelligence or something of that kind. Yeah. If you think, if, I mean, if, if it, uh, you know, any of the four of you happen to actually just be AI, right? Not well, what's, what's Dan? <laughs> yeah. Well, Dan. indeed, where would you want to live? I mean, then it probably wouldn't be Peoria. I mean, you want to live in some place where there's a lot of uh, uh, available energy, that kind of thing. You don't care about things like water or atmospheres or any of the things that biology requires. You know, you just require some, some energy and some raw material to build more machines. And, you know, that isn't necessarily on a planet like the Earth. And I think yes. uh, one of, somewhere, one of the somewhere more stable about, would be. More or something ideal. very cold, I think, is uh, another idea. Since like, the, those production, those processes would produce, or likely to produce a lot of heat or something like excess heat, perhaps. And then they'd want to stay somewhere pretty cold uh, you know, in some of the areas that we wouldn't find, you know, you see, you know, habitable at all. Just like places that are the coldest. I can't remember what exactly those areas were. I know there's a term for it um, uh, that was mentioned, but I can't remember. It's like the small little cold spots out in space, like. I used to be anywhere in between stars, really. Well, but... <laughs> yeah, space itself is pretty cold, actually. Yeah, <laughs> Any of yeah. Those yeah but you, you might want that if you're a machine, right? And this is just, you know, uh, college thermodynamics, but the efficiency of any machine you have uh, depends on the difference in temperature between the machine and the environment. So colder environments allow you to have a little bit more efficiency, if that's a consideration, which it may right. not be. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about because in uh, in our circles we run the wow signal was always has always been a big a big thing that was like the that was really like the first thing they found that they thought that this might be an ET signal 
and it only happened once for like 74 seconds or something. They could never find it again. What, uh, can you explain exactly what, what that was? Yeah. Uh, by the way, that was not the first time that they that a signal was picked up that people thought might be for real. Uh, that was actually Project Ozma. The first time anybody looked for a signal, they picked up one. So they thought it might be ET, and it turns out it was probably the U.S. military, although nobody knows. But the, <laughs> but, but the wow signal uh, was picked up at Ohio State University. Ohio State, there in lovely Columbus, had a big radio astronomy instrument, uh, you know, the, the big big ears, they called it, but it was this very cleverly designed, very big antenna. But, uh, you know, by the 1970s, it was really sort of obsolete. There were much better radio telescopes around, so they didn't know what to do with it. They just sort of locked it down and uh, let the sky sort of, you know, rotate above it as it does because of the rotation of the Earth. And they would just, you know, look for signals. And they did one day, the uh, Jerry Amon, I think, was the name of the astronomer. He walks into the the uh, room where all the equipment for this uh, radio telescope was housed. And he looks at the computer printout because in those days, of course, uh, computers outputted their uh, results on paper. And uh, he found this big signal. He wrote wow next to it because he was impressed. And that became the wow signal. Now, it, it was only seen once. Well, the antenna actually had two receivers on it. So it would reobserve the same portion of the sky a second time about a minute later, as you say. So they found it once, and they didn't find it the second time, and they never found it again, and nobody has ever found it again. Many people have looked. So that's the wow signal was called, called that because, you know, this guy wrote wow uh, with a magic marker <laughs> on the printout. But wow. if, if it isn't found a second time, you can't really get too excited about it. Ben, so the reason he was excited because it wasn't like that, that narrow band that you look for, but just because it was never – seen again there's really not much to yeah, it. it was picked up at, yeah it, it also had the the shape as a function of time that you would expect from a source of radio energy that's you know just in the sky and it goes into the beam and then out of the beam as the earth rotates and it did that exactly correctly so it, it could have been and maybe it was but nobody's ever found it again so you can't say well we found et you can say whatever you like but you won't get much support for saying that it's ET because you didn't find it again. Have you ever so used I, that argument against a flat earther? I I, I am a flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it all along. All right. So why are you wasting so much time studying the firmament then? Well, I, you know, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> I mean, suppose we were to find something, you know, how would, how would your lives change? And you would know yeah. something really interesting. I mean, it. It doesn't mean that suddenly you're going to double your salary or anything like that, because it's unlikely you will, unless you can understand what the aliens are saying and somehow commercialize that, that information. But it's, it's just interesting to know uh, in the same way that, you know, a lot of basic research is not looking for applications of the knowledge so much as just to know things, you know, how, how atoms work or stuff like that. And in astronomy, there's a lot of that. I mean, astronomy doesn't have too much in the way of application. Uh, it did a couple of hundred years ago. You could tell time accurately with astronomy, and that was important to navigation on the seas. But, you know, these days, astronomy...